Hi, I'm Donald Siegel, um, senior mechanical engineer with the Sai Seiko, and as he said, I've been with the company for almost 11 years, from virtually the day they opened their office in the U.S. Does anybody here from attend the last Tech Fest? No, we're no a fresh audience. Fresh. Good. So all those stale old jokes will work. All my stale old jokes will still work. Good. Let me give you a little background on Asai Seiko. Asai Seiko is a company that's been around since 1969. They initially started manufacturing miniature model trains in Japan. The owner of the company was a model train fanatic and he wanted to start his own company to manufacture trains. Couldn't make a, a living at it. So what he decided to do is to look around the market in Japan, find out what was needed, what kind of product was required in their market that wasn't being satisfied. And the, mark, the, the product he hit on was coin handling equipment. He started out with coin acceptors and coin validators. Um, the old mechanical ones, roll down type coin necks, which you see in amusement games. From there he branched into coin dispensers, card dispensers, bill validators, bill dispensers, uh, floppy diskette dispensers, CD jewel case dispensers, anything you can imagine, any type of product you can imagine needing, needing to be dispensed, he's built a product to do it in. He opened the office in the U.S. in 1989 to specifically service the, um, the gaming industry and the U.S. market um, more generally. We also have an office in England that he opened in 1995, I believe, 94 or 95. And they handle uh, the European gaming community and European market for the other products. We have a facility just up the street where we manufacture the, um, our flagship product, the DH750 coin hopper, which is in virtually every gaming machine manufacturer's machine, with the exception of IGT and Aristocrat and a, a few sundry other ones. You'll find it in WMS, you'll find them in Bally, you'll find them in Atronic, you'll find them in some of the smaller ones, the old VLC, which was Powerhouse, which was Anchor, which is now IGT. Interesting thing about that, the people who started VLC, Video Lottery Consultants, which was originally came from Bally, or um, from IGT. And then the people who started Anchor originally came out of IGT. So it's kind of come kind of a full circle. IGT then bought back everything that they've worked on for the last few years. So we're in virtually everybody's machine out there. So you'll be, if you're not familiar with it, you've seen our hopper and I'd like to make you familiar with it as, as much as possible um, with what we're going to do today. If anybody has any questions while I'm going through, feel free to raise your hand. I have a question. I reserve the right to ignore you. Oh, don't ignore me. <laughs> yes. Hey, Don, does, does SI Seiko mean something? It's a good question, Randy. <laughs> anybody speak Japanese? No, oh, okay. Asai, I, I speak a little bit enough to get myself in trouble. Sai Seiko. <clears throat> the, the words themselves have, have a distinct meaning. There are two common Japanese words. Asahi, which is also the name of a beer and a newspaper and a couple other things, means, and it depend, depends on how you use it, it means either the morning or the future or something coming up. Seiko, another common Japanese word, means high quality. So when you put those two words together with our product line, you get the future of high quality coin handling equipment. The, um, our, the owner of our company was, I guess you could say, pretty ingenious when he came up with, with that because you get a description of what our, our product line is and you get a description of where he's going. He's looking at the future and you get a, also an indication that he's looking at high quality. Okay? There's about four Asahi Seiko companies, and none of them are related because they're common Japanese words that are used all over the place. It's like um, we're not related to Seiko instruments or Seiko watches or any of that stuff. We're not related to the Asahi beer. So don't worry about it, Randy. <laughs> but the other Asahi Seikos, there's one that makes valves. There's one that uh, makes bearings and gears. I don't remember what the fourth one makes, and then there's ours.
What's that? Gears. Gears? It's a hot item today. You have a special Okay. So again, if you have any questions while I'm going along, raise your hand. If I see you, fine. If I don't, fine. If I ignore you, fine. I'll try and answer all your questions. <clears throat> what I'm going to go through is um, kind of a step-by-step -step on the, the teardown and rebuilding of the hopper, including um, converting it from one denomination to another. Sometimes that happens out in the casinos where your quarter machines aren't making as much as the, the casino would like, so they think that nickels would do better, so they convert a whole bank of machines to nickels, and then those don't start, so they convert them to something else, and it's a constant process that goes on in the casinos. <clears throat> there are some things to be aware of when doing a conversion. It's not just a matter of replacing parts. Um, sometimes there's some adjustments that need to be made, and if those adjustments aren't properly made, what you could end up with is um, mispays. And we all know the customers don't like mispays, except if it's an overpay. If they get an overpay, they love them, extra money. Okay, in the teardown or the, the, the working of a hopper, you need just a, a handful of tools. Hoppers are all metric. Fasteners are metric. All the dimensions on the parts are metric. The reason behind that is the, the company itself is worldwide. We handle Asia, Japan, Australia, Europe, Africa, Russia, um, Scandinavia, all over the world. And there's only one country in the world that uses English fasteners. It's an embarrassment, isn't it? That's the U.S. <laughs> so what we've done is we've tried to standardize our manufacturer since we also manufacture in Japan and our office in Japan gets calls from some of our customers who might be in South America for parts so we standardize on metric fasteners so the whole size Echo product line worldwide uses the same types of fasteners. It gets a little frustrating for some of the US slot techs because it all is all metric but that's fine. We can work around that. Okay, here's the tools you need when you're working on a hopper. It's a handful. Write them down. I don't want anybody to say they weren't told. You need, I'll start with the screwdrivers. An instrument you don't take on the plane with you. A real long screwdriver. You know, this one screwdriver I almost got taken away from me in San, San Jose. I was coming back from a location there in the security, saw the screwdriver go through in my bag through the x-ray, she looked at it, she looked at it again, and she looked at it again, called over the security guard, of course opened the bag up. Was this post September 11th? No, this was a couple years ago. Security guard comes through and has me open the bag and he starts looking through it and all of a sudden you see this big long screwdriver come out of the bag and he's you can't take this on the plane. So anyway, I talked to him, I talked to him into letting me take it on. And they called their manager for security, and he said, ah, let him go. So anyway. Really long number two Phillips. It's a really long number two Phillips. So you need a number two Phillips. It doesn't have to be this long. You can use a stubby one if you want. Number one Phillips. A seven millimeter nut driver. Or you can use a seven millimeter box end wrench. And then a 5.5 millimeter nut driver or box end wrench. A pair of needle nose pliers would be very handy. And last but not least, a feeler gauge. It has to have a eight thousandths of an inch feeler on there, which is 0 0.2 millimeters. Or 0 0.008 for those of you that are still working on it. 0.008, right. Those are the tools you need to work on the hopper. Um, the, for the majority of it, there's a couple other sundry little things you may need. Um, an eight millimeter nut driver could be handy, but this is what you'd need 99% of the time, okay? Now there's some English equivalents that are close <laughs> that will work. So you can go ahead and fiddle with that in your toolboxes and come up with the closest one you want if you don't want to get the metric ones. 
All right. Hopper consists of a few specific components or areas of operation. You have the hopper bowl. Some people call it a hopper head. It functions as a reservoir for the bulk storage of coins. You have the chassis frame, which is what... Don could you spin that around so we can see here and then... No. You have the, 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 the base frame or chassis frame assembly, which is what holds the whole thing together and slides in the machine. You have the motor assembly. This one happens to be a DC motor. And then the rest of the hopper is the dispensing apparatus or the dispensing mechanism, which handles picking the coins up out of the reservoir, moving them to the coin exit, and counting them as they're being dispensed. There you go. Now you're... Now you're cooking. And yeah, the last component is the count mechanism. The most important part of the hopper itself is the count mechanism. If that doesn't work, the hopper's a doorstop. Or a boat anchor if you've got a boat. Funny story. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm an engineer. I'm not a comic. Okay. First thing you do when you're working on the hopper is you need, you need to get access to the, the components or the parts. So you need to remove the hopper head. There's four screws that hold the hopper head on. They're all spring-loaded. The springs ha are color-coded. You have two springs. The top two are black. The bottom two are gold. Okay? Remember that. Black on top, gold on bottom. There's a reason why they're like that. The um, springs themselves are of a different tension. The black springs are stiffer than the gold springs, so it takes more force to compress them. And then when you get to this mounting screw that's at the, what I call the five o'clock position down here, what you'll find, and if you can focus in on that, there's an added little nut on there that extends the shoulder. You get two side by side here. You can see one's got the, the nut on it right there, and the other one doesn't. What it does is it extends the shoulder, and it effectively extends how much the bowl can float or flex in that particular location. So with the, the coins are dispensed as a, the pinwheel rotates counterclockwise. So they pick up the coins down here at the 6 o'clock position, they come up toward the 3 o'clock position. Well, all of your force is going to be generated right in this particular area. And by allowing that extra shoulder length, we allow the hopper some ability to free itself of any types of soft jams that the coins stack up right there. It gives it some self-jam clearing abilities. Okay. When you get the hopper bowl off, you're looking at the, the, the main components of the hopper, the, the guts, the, the, the engine. What runs the whole thing? You've got the pinwheel, you've got the, the stirring mechanism, the knife, the exit chute, and you've got a, a couple of components up here which help to separate the coins in case you get two coins stuck together. We all know, we all know what happens when people get mad at machines that take their money. They like to pour their drinks down them. Beer, wine, soda. I knew a story about a guy who stood up on the bar and urinated in the machine. So, <laughs> that one got that one got more more laugh. Well, he did. It's an honest story. So, lots of nasty things go into machines. Okay. And sometimes they glue coins together. So what we do is we try to separate it so you don't get two coming out at the same time. <coughs> okay. One of the things you were given was a conversion manual. There, it's in the process of being rewritten and revised right as we speak. But the information is the same. And the process that you go through is um, the same. Oh, put my water over here. Okay. Let me put this over here. So okay. Out of the way. You, you also got a, a little goodie today. Last time I did the Tech Fest, I had one guy, last question he asked, he says, 
Do you have anything for us? Any giveaways? And I, all, I always know how slot techs love giveaways, so I brought something today. It's not much, but it was all I could dig up. Somebody ever asked me for my shirt. Gee. Do you all, do you all see the $20 bill that's tacked inside the manual that we've given out? <laughs> <laughs> What's that? No, we all want a shirt. You all want a shirt. Oh, okay. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll talk to our marketing department and see if I can do something about that. <laughs> that was fast. Yeah, that was quick. That's why you get the big bucks, your decision making ability. That's it. Okay. First thing you want to do, I'll, I'll step you through converting from one denomination to another, including the, the adjustments you need to make um, when you get to your new coin. First thing you want to do is you start from the top and you work yourself in. So there's components that sit on top of other ones. And there, there, when you get the, the conversion kit for a different denomination, it usually comes in a package like this. That package will have usually individual packets in there which cover separate areas on the hopper itself. Okay? So you'll have like you'll have the pinwheel, you'll have the the knife with its associated hardware, you'll have the, the coin separator components with their associated hardware, and then the exit pieces with their associated hardware. The kit always comes with the hardware you need because sometimes no matter how careful we are a screw or a washer falls on the floor and in those brightly colored casino carpets, a lot of times you can't find them. So we put the hardware in there. When you take the components off, and here's a neat trick I like to do. On, on a lot of our newer hoppers, we have dual tool fasteners. You can either use a, a nut driver or you can use a Phillips head screw to take the, the fasteners off. That was an innovation we came up with here because in Japan, the, the, the culture is tr tremendously different. They'll take one of these hoppers and if it jams or fails, they'll throw the whole hopper away and put a brand new one in. They won't try and fix it. They won't try and clear a jam on the floor. Okay? Gaming's not legal there, but they won't do it. They'll take the whole hopper out and put a brand new one in. That way they don't have to... It, it's a minimum amount of downtime on the, on the floor. If they get a hopper jam, they just put a new one in and throw the old one away. They won't fix it. So Japan, when they put this together, they put it together once and that's it. Now over here, typical Americans love to fix things. <laughs> They'll keep the hopper going for 30 years, even if it's a brand new hopper. It's like the story about the guy with the pocket knife. Uh, said, I've had this knife for 30 years. It's had five new blades and six new handles. That's pretty much what goes on with, with See, the hoppers. That's a funny joke. It is your delivery. <laughs> no bonus for you. Okay, so you start from the top, work yourself in. And when you take the, the components off, what I like to do and what I would recommend is you set them down in little piles. So you have your coin separator pile, you'd have your knife pile, you'd have your exit chute pile. Okay, and I'll get to why in just a moment. So what are you taking take, off there, buddy? What I'm taking off here, we call it a jump, uh, jump assembly. It's got two purposes. It's one purpose is it acts as a secondary coin separator or coin wiper. Another purpose is as the, the coin transitions from the pinwheel to the knife, it kind of leans a little bit. And the little rubber part that extends down keeps the coin from jumping off of the knife. So it, it gets flowing directly to the exit. That, set that aside. Oh, let me point this out while we're here. What did they do? They sealed this. Okay. One of the things you notice on some of the newer DH750 hoppers is we used to have a um, chute cover which looked like that. Okay? Thin material, stainless steel, very nice and shiny has a big half moon cut out in it. We discovered or were alerted to a problem, a potential cheating problem on the hoppers. 
and we re redesigned that chute cover. It's now made out of a thicker material, and if you look on the hopper, it's got a um, little finger that sticks out underneath the roller lever. Okay. We use a four-point mounting instead of a three-point now. We used to only use a three-point. So that's one of the parts that have changed to um, improve the security of the hopper. Uh, retrofitable? Retrofitable. Direct Even backwards about, and forward. Where does the four screw go? Well, on the knives, you probably have to change the knife to get the four-point mounting, but you can still get it on the, you can still put it on there with a the three-point mounting. Okay. Okay. Next assembly you remove is the exit chute, and if you follow along in the manual, it goes step by step. Um, you can vary some of the steps, but the process is right there for you to work with. And again, take the parts off and kind of keep them in separate little piles. Okay. Next thing is to take off the knife. The knife's got two nuts on the back of the hopper holding, which secure the bolts, and it's got two bolts on the front. You need to remove the nuts on the back first. Oh, it's threaded and it has a nut on the front. Right. Now, we're coming up with a uh, modification to it to new hoppers which eliminate the nuts on the back. What we're doing is we're putting threaded studs firmly fixed into the, the metal chassis plate so you get two threaded studs that come up and then there will be a nut on the front. Okay, Eliminate another piece of hardware that can get lost. Okay, you get the bolts loosened from the knife. Now, when you take the knife off, thing to be very careful of. Don't don't remove the bolts. Leave the bolts that just as they're sitting in loose, and then take the whole assembly off in one motion because the majority of the time you will find two shim washers or more than two shim washers behind the knife. It's important that they go back exactly in the same location that they came from. Okay? So that's why I took it off that way because then they're sitting right there and you can lay the knife just down on the table with the two bolts there and you know exactly where those two washers go. We've come up with um, something else that we eliminate those and they'll be eliminated on probably 99.99% .99 of the hoppers except for some various unusual coins or tokens out there. The aluminum um, ring that everything's mounted to in the past was not precision ground or precision machined. And because of that, what you get is you get some tolerance fluctuations. So they, they, the shim washers were placed in there to adjust for those tolerances and get the knife tip into its optimum position. What we've done is, and it just happened to fall into the end of the life for the tooling for the, um, the mounting ring. We decided to precision machine that, and now it's got two little standoffs built in just under the knife mounting, which take the place of the shim washers and still get the knife tip in its optimum location. So you eliminate the shim washers. Like I said, on virtually every hopper, there will be a couple unusual coins or tokens that they may need to be on there for. Okay, when you get the, the knife off, you remove the center screw from the pinwheel. That's spring loaded. So you want to be careful. You don't want a part to shoot across. You don't want it to um, shoot it. go. <laughs> <laughs> wow, it was so fast I didn't even see that. Here, Randy, come on down. Real close. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's spring loaded. The spring underneath is tapered. It's wider on the bottom and it comes to a narrow at the top, so you want to remember that when you put it down. Okay? You want it the, the narrow end up when you put it on there. Okay, there's one other screw. It's slightly offset from the center one. Loosen that one. Don't remove it. 
There's a neat little trick. Use it as a handle. And you pull your pinwheel right off. And the bearing. Okay. Sure. Okay. Makes a neat little handle for removing it and replacing it. One of the things you want to do at this point in time, inspect your bearings. Make sure there's a light coat of grease on it. Um, not a heavy coat, but just a very light coat. The grease you can use, you can use like a Vaseline, a very light lithium grease. Um, you can use a light Teflon oil, something like that. You don't want anything real heavy. Uh, a question, I was told never to use Vaseline because it evaporates so quickly and gets sticky. But Vaseline is cool. So We've never know. had any problems using it. Okay. <clears throat> now, <laughs> <laughs> Randy, keep your mind out of the gutter. Okay, but you want you want to examine the to make sure there's some grease in there, and you also want to examine this the plate underneath to make sure there's no substantial bearing wear. In other words, there's not a deep groove cut in there from the the, the ball bearings. Because what that'll do is it'll allow the, the pinwheel to sink, which then opens up the gap behind the knife and the pinwheel, and you can get a coin that gets lodged behind there. So you want to check and make sure that there isn't a um, substantial groove in there. If there is, it's probably a time just to get a new hopper and put it in there, unless you want to do a complete tear down and build it up from the ground up. Okay. I'll just put it back as what it is, but as, as what it was instead of rebuilding it. In the kit, you'll get a new pinwheel, you'll get the knife, you'll get the exit chute cover, and you'll get the, the coin separator and jump protector assembly. Okay. On your new disc, put on the, the stirring assembly, put your screw back in again. Leave it sticking out a little bit because you can use it as a nice convenient handle. There's a couple ways you can put the pinwheel on. And which method you use is up to you and depending on how energetic you want to be. You can leave the hopper sitting on the table operationally. Try and get the, the race centered and stick the pinwheel on. Well, if you listen to that, you can hear that the, the race isn't seated properly. There's also something to look for, the um, surface right here and the shelf on the disc should be flush. Okay. Well, we've got to seat the, um, the bearings. Neat little trick, just tip your hopper back, take a screwdriver. Can I see that again? Please just tilt it a little more. So we can okay. Put it down on there. Tilt the hopper up. Underneath there's a dust drainage hole for coin dust. We all know how dirty coins get. So there's a drainage hole there. Okay, you can take a screwdriver. You can take either your number one Phillips or you can take one of those little small electronic screwdrivers. Stick it up behind the pinwheel and you can push up on the bearing race until you hear it click in place. Everybody hear that click? Okay. Now if you spin it, you can hear that the bearing's seated. Okay. Yeah, and it's flush. Okay. Now, if you're feeling really energetic, you can take and just seat the, the bearings in the disc. Pick the whole hopper up, set it on there like that. That's one way to do it. Or you can really gob the grease on this and stick that to that and stick it on there this way. But again, you don't want a heavy grease. So I found this to be the easiest. And you can hear it click in place when it seats. There's three things to remember on the hopper when you're working on it. Look, listen, and feel. If it looks funny when you're working on it, if it sounds funny when you're working on it, if it feels funny when you're working on it, then chances are something's not right with it. Okay? When you get the hopper in place, what you want to do is you want to rotate the pinwheel. Let me make sure I get that right. 
completely clockwise, as far as it'll go till it stops. Okay? Then you tighten up your little offset screw here. If you notice right now, the pinwheel's pretty loose. What'll happen is if you leave it that way and go into operation, you could get a potential <coughs> where a, um, the hopper will kick out an extra coin because it's allowed to free spin for a little bit. And so you want to rotate it all the way clockwise till it stops. Tighten up your offset screw and just snug it down. Don't gorilla tighten it. And you get a nice firm pinwheel. What we're working on now is we're working on a possibility of eliminating that offset screw by replacing, by, instead of having just two pins on the back, we'll have four. One, there's two benefits to that. One is you don't have that extra piece of hardware. And number two is a lot of the manufacturers like DC motors because you can do a reverse on them to help clear coin jams. With that little offset screw, when you're reversing, you've got the motor pushing against the screw, and the screw likes to bend. So by putting four pins on here, we're eliminating the screw, and we're giving a nice solid surface for the motor to push on, whether it's going reverse or forward. So we're working on getting all that in place. Okay, so you get the pinwheel. What I like to do is just spin it, listen to it, see how it sounds. <clears throat> Pick up your knife, your, your new knife, put the bolts in place, put the shim washers exactly where they came off of on the old knife. Yes? Okay, if you've lost the washers from behind the knife, uh, or if they've fallen off and you and you um, pick them up off the floor and you're not sure where they went, generally you'll have two different washers. You'll have a, a thin one and you'll have a thicker one. Generally, the thin one goes up at the top and the thicker one will go down at the bottom. Okay, that's generally. Um, if Can you, you point those out again, please? The thin one will go up at the top mounting hole for the knife, and the thick one will generally go down at the bottom one. Okay, but if you're, if you're still not sure, here's um, I'll give you a piece of information on how to guarantee that you, you get it mounted, um, put back together correctly. So you put the knife in place, and there's an optimum location for the tip of the knife. And if you look in the manual, it's on page... <coughs> Page five. You see about three pictures down on the right. And if you look over to the note directly next to it, it says keep 0 0.2 millimeter clearance between the knife and the disc shelf. Okay? That's where your little feeler gauge comes into play. You stick what you want is you want 0 0.2 maximum between the tip of the knife and the shelf and behind the knife and the shelf. Okay? So you can stick your feeler gauge right in there when you get it there and tighten up your bolts. Okay? And that's a maximum, 0 0.2. You don't want it touching because that'll lead to a premature wear <laughs> or, or scoring of the pinwheel. Now the knife has moved and everything, so you're gonna you're tightening right. the holes up. Kind of They're not and then be, be right. I just snug them up so you still get some movement out of the knife. Put your feet of the gauge in there. Push down as tight as you can get it. And then finish tightening your bolts. If you've got a little tiny shim washer. That's eight thousandths of an inch thick. That works out perfect because you can just stick it right in there and let it sit there. See, the feeler gauge likes to flop down all the way. So that's where you want it, and then you can take your feeler gauge and run it up behind <coughs> a couple times to make sure you got a. It's nice and free back there. Okay. Would you consider that to be a really a critical? Degree? That is critical because. I never see anybody using feeler gauge. Like I said, you can use a shim wheel, a uh, little shim under. But I, on our hoppers, that's critical. There's a very good reason for it. 
Okay? If you get the knife tip too high, what you've got is when the coin comes up there, you've got a curb that it's got to ride up over. And it, picture a car jumping up over a curb on the street. Okay? You're going to have two things happen. First, you're going to wear out your tires quick. Second, you're going to round off the curb. Okay? Same thing's going to happen with the knife. You're going to wear out the edge of the coin, and the tip of the knife is going to start to curl down. And the more it curls down, the more pronounced that jump is. Another thing that could happen there is the, co you know, the coins could keep flopping off the, the knife back into the hopper. They hit that, it's like hitting a wall, and they fall back into the hopper bowl. Okay? So you want the tip of the knife down as close as you can get it to the pinwheel. It's at 0 0.2 <coughs> millimeters max, but as tight as possible. And then, again, you rotate the disc and you listen. If you hear it scratching or making contact or grinding on it, then you're too tight. Okay? And I didn't do it right to save some time, but you, you want to use the shim, wheel, the shim or the, um, the feeler gauge to make sure you've got it in its optimum location. Okay. Put the nuts back on the back of the knife, bolts, and this is where it's handy to have either two nut drivers or two seven millimeter box stand wrenches. What you can do is you can put your, your nut driver on the back or on the front, whichever way you like it. Hold it with the wrench. Uh, on the back side with the wrench. And then snug it up. That way you get it, make sure you get it locked down. And again at each stage Rotate it, look, listen, and feel. And I forgot a part. Shame on you for not telling me about it. You got to put your disc spring back in the center. Actually, that can go on at any. That can go in at any point in time as long as it's in. Okay. And you don't have to comp really compress that down. Just snug it up. If you want to use a little Loctite on the screws to help hold them in place, that's fine. Just use the, the, the regular the Loctite. Don't use the stuff. You have to use a heat gun to get it off or a welding torch. Okay. Put your jump assembly back on. Your jump assembly will probably come in the kit in pieces. It will consist of a gold metal piece which we call the adjusting plate. It will consist of a rubber piece and it will consist of a spring steel piece. Unless you get an unusual coin, there's some out there that they don't even use these parts. But you're all from the US so you won't see any of those. <coughs> the, yeah. Semi all right, something like that. The adjusting plate is stamped with a number on the back. Can you focus in on that number? See that little number right there? Okay. What that is, that is a designation for the thickness of the adjusting plate, and that will give you an idea of what thickness coin it's for. Okay. In this instance, that number 18 actually represents 1.8 millimeters. So you can use it for a coin that's approximately... 1.8 millimeters? That's big. <coughs> oh, millimeters, not centimeters. Right, millimeters. Okay. <laughs> but I'm American. They'll have different, they'll have di there'll be ones with different numbers on there. And which number you use depends on the thickness of the coin you're, you're going to. So you can assemble those by placing them on the hopper or you can just assemble them in your hand by using a little M3 screw in the, the hole out there. And tighten it up. 
Again, just just snug them up because you don't want that rubber to be compressed so it deforms. That goes on. It only goes on in one location. You can't put it on upside down. You can't put it on over here. It sits in one spot and it'll sit there just like it is. You put the screw in and snug her down and you're ready to go. Put the rubber coin separator. It consists of two pieces. The, the rubber separator itself and the separator retainer. Now the separator retainer will come in possibly three variations. You'll have it either flat, you'll have it with a slight bend, or you'll have it with a, an exaggerated bend. And which one you use depends on the thickness of the coin. The thicker the coin, the flatter this thing separator retainer becomes. Okay, so that like the dollar tokens will be flat. 50 cents will have a slight bend, then you get down to the quarters and it'll have the, the more exaggerated bend. <coughs> That's interchangeable for all denominations. The only one that doesn't require this is the U.S. nickel coin. The, the biggest reason, and we haven't figured out why, to be honest with you, but we found that it works better without it for the nickel coin. You see, Working with coin out and coin in is, it's interesting because coins don't follow any logical rules. They do what you don't expect them to do and they don't do what you expect them to do. You weren't in on me. Come on, Randy. Okay. Okay. Just sits right up alongside of there. You take your screw and tighten it down. See, I, was, I used to work for a, um, one of the game manufacturers. They were a small one. It was called United Gaming. Then it became Alliance. Then it, they bought Bally Gaming. I was long before they bought Bally. But one of the things I, I saw while working for them on the machine end is they had their, their CPU board completely encased in a, a box, a metal box. There was only one opening in that box, and that was the, the cutout for the lock. Okay? A lot smaller than a quarter, right? Somehow a quarter got through that little opening in there and shorted some of the circuits. Nobody knows how. Nobody's been able to duplicate it, but coins do weird things when they're out in the machine. Even in your pocket, they'll do weird things. Okay. You get those parts on, and then you put your exit, shoot, exit cover on. <coughs> exit cover has normally three components. <sighs> I got butter all over my fingers. Here. Okay. <laughs> okay, you'll normally have three components. The dollar token only has two. doesn't require the spacer plate. So you've got a spacer plate, you've got a coin guide, okay, and then you've got the chute cover itself. Anything, anybody notice anything interesting about the coin guide? What do you notice interesting about it? Standardized? No. Nope. Feel it. Oh, it's spring steel. Feel it. Or it's stiff. It feels stiff. What do, you, what do you feel besides stiffness? Texture? Which side are we talking about? I don't know. Give me a clue. I don't know. It's Teflon coated. Yeah. No way. Uh huh. Oh, it's pretty slippery. It's Teflon coated, and that helps the coins to s slide right out of that exit. <laughs> what are you I doing? I didn't touch it. I didn't touch it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but it's Teflon coated. The um, the dollar one is Teflon coated, and it's got some uh, upraised grooves in it. The dollar chute cover is Teflon coated on the inside. Okay? So there's those two key features. So when you see that stuff start flaking off and peeling off there, it, it might be time to think about replacing that so you can get that nice smooth action of the coin coming out. I've seen some of these where the Teflon coating was completely worn off and the casino was still using them because they felt it was you didn't know it. still worthwhile. 
Well, the, the, the rest of the hopper looked like somebody had um, thrown it in the dumpster for 30 years. And, but. Okay. So you put the spacer plate on, the coin guide, and then the chute cover. You've got four mounting locations on the newer chute covers. You've got two up at the top, which take an M4 screw, and then you've got two down at the bottom, which take a little tiny M3 screw. And you just go ahead and tighten them down. No real adjustment on that at all. Just where it sits. Again, you probably want to spin your pinwheel. You want to listen. You want to look at it. You want to feel it to see if everything seems to be okay. Now, here's where the adjustment comes in. You take the coin you're going to dispense. Don't take a reasonable facsimile. Don't take something that's close. Take the actual coin you're going to dispense. You load it in on the pinwheel. And you rotate the pinwheel till you get the roller lever at its maximum deflection. Okay? You want the roller lever so that's maximum deflection. What'll happen is focus in on here. The center of the coin, the center of the roller lever, the center of the coin, and the center of this screw on the knife should all line up in a line. So if you draw a line through those three points, the center should all line up. This isn't that maximum deflection, but I think you can get the idea. Okay? The centers of those three objects should line up in a line. Okay? Then you take the hopper around, and you'll see the proximity sensor. Okay, and this is where you, you've got to look in. You've got to look at how the proximity sensor is adjusted to the flag uh, on the roller lever. And what you want is you loosen up two screws down underneath the proximity sensor. Wrong screwdriver. That'll give you the ability to move this up and down, okay? Okay. Now if you look down in here, you can see the bottom tip of the flag. Okay? You want the bottom tip of that to be even or just slightly protruding from the bottom of the sensor. Okay? So if you get it even with the bottom of the sensor or just slightly protruding below it, you're okay. And then you tighten up. The sensor. I'm just trying to see what the heck it is that you're talking about. Oh, I see. Okay. Hey, let me get in here with the camera. So he, might I don't know if tight. you, like me, <coughs> know what he was doing, but let me get in there with the camera because it's obvious. Take a break. Relax. There's two stages to the adjustment when you adjust the sensor for a new coin. This is step, step one to make sure that's adjusted properly. Okay? What we're talking about is the bottom of that little piece that's sticking out. See the tab that's sticking out when it's in the right. The bottom, the about? bottom of that flag. The bottom of that flag. If you see it adjusted to the yeah. top of this. No, to the bottom of this. To, to the, the bottom. bottom. Oh, you don't right. have the coin in there anymore. You you knock the coin out. Okay. There it is. All right. Okay. So it's, it's sticking way out now, as you can see. Right. It's sticking way out now. So you want it just just barely or flush. See, you screwed me up. Now I got to readjust it. That's where you bring the sensor down. About right there. It's okay. I'm just trying to give you my cold. Okay. And then you just tighten those screws up. That's step one. Okay. Yeah. Did everybody get that? You got that? Okay. Now, if you're working with a wait, hopper, wait, 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 wait. let's oh. do, do it one more time. This, oh, there goes the coin again. Sorry. Here's, here's, the, here's the guy that, that goes into the middle of the optic, which is the process. Right. Okay. So that when that coin is in place, watch it drop, watch it drop. It goes to 
the very bottom edge. See it coming out yep. there? No, Not that far. Just yeah. right to the just, just a hair. Right, just a hair. Okay. That was difficult to see. Yes. No, it does not. It varies depending. He, he wanted to know if the rocker arm or the what we call the roller lever varied between denominations. The answer is no. It does vary if you're using a micro switch over a proximity sensor. Okay? But that's only in, in the, the, the flag area itself. And by proximity sensor, do you mean both optic and the Hall effect sensor? You're talking about optic? Okay. The proxi we only have two count switches on the hopper. We have a micro switch, which is a purely mechanical one. And we use um, another sensor which is called a proximity sensor. It's not an optic, so there's no light beam. It doesn't get dirty. <laughs> and it's not um, what's commonly known as a Hall effect sensor. What ours is, is it's a U-shaped sensor. Let me draw you a picture. And it's purely, ma it's purely magnetic, okay? So what you've got is you've got your U-shaped sensor. And we've got little coils on either side, and they generate a magnetic field across there. Now, when that magnetic field is broken, it generates an output pulse, okay? And it can be anything metallic to break that field, any metallic object. Coin dust, not a problem because there's not enough conductivity in just coin dust to, to do it, okay? So it's active. That's it. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And it's nice because there's no moving parts, and it doesn't get dirty, so the only, but the only way it will wear out on you is if you hook it up backwards, or it reaches its useful, um, useful life, and I think if I remember correctly, that was better than 15 million cycles or 15 billion cycles, I don't remember exactly, but it's, it's a high number for its useful life. Okay? Yes? On the, on the flags on the slant top machines, like the Williams machines, they get bent when the hoppers get put back in place. The flags on the, the slant tops, they get bent. Wearing away on that. On okay. That That's on the escalator ones. Yeah. So at what point would you recommend replacing these shows anywhere on the slight wear? You know, I've seen The sensor itself? Yeah, the sensor itself. Um, if it shows slight wear, you shouldn't have any problems. If, if it's got significant gouges in it, I'd, I'd say to, it'd be time to replace it. Slight wear won't damage it at all. Yeah, the, the, the housing on them is pretty robust. And like I said, because there's no moving parts in there, there's really nothing to get damaged. But if you start seeing some serious gougings in there or some serious cracking in the housing, you'd be best to, to get it replaced because you don't want your count switch going down. Yes? That's stage two. I'm going. Uh huh. Okay. That's step two on the adjustment process. I was going, I'm going to go on. There was one more question, and then we'll. Uh huh. Yes. Okay. The proximity sensor has three wires. Like you said, it's red, black, and white. The red is four and a half to 15 volts DC. The black wire is your ground or your zero volts, and the white wire is your output pulse from the sensor. Between the black and the white, yes. It'll be low. Without an object, you're, it'll be low. When it's activated, that'll go high. Are we talking logic level zero and five? Or? Yes. Without it being activated, you're getting a constant high. Then it's, the sensor's burned out. On the white wire. And the sensor's burned out. Okay, it should, it should be constant low until activated. Then it will go high, and when it's deactivated, it goes low again. Okay. We've had now. It, let me clarify that. We've had a couple of manufacturers that have switched from using a micro switch to the proximity sensor, 
And what, the way they were using the micro switch is they were using the micro switch where it was constant high until activated, then go constant low. So what was done was they incorporated a um, transistor and resistor into the proximity sensor circuit, so they flipped the logic. And I think one of the, the game manufacturers that's doing that is Coal Industries. Okay. Somebody's here from Coal. That's you. That's you. That's so. If you've got a that transistor on there, then the logic's flip, flip is flipped on the circuit. Okay. Yeah, I think that's what's going on there. Okay. So it, it depends on the manufacturer. Normally, it's low until high and goes high, but in a couple of cases, and it's um, CDS is another one. Um, Casino Data Systems is another one that did their games like that. They're high and then they go low in the presence of a coin. Okay. Oh, that's good. Okay. We have about uh, two minutes before break, two or three minutes. Good. We're right on time because after this we'll work on the escalator hopper. Step two of the adjustment. If you look on the, the roller lever, there's a bolt right over here. Okay. And that's held in place with a nut. Can you see it? Go ahead. Okay. Well, you can see it. Just, so what you want to do is you want to loosen that nut up Sorry. so you get some motion in that bolt. You can move it up and down. And you want to move that bolt up or down. Come on. You running out of tape? I'm out. Go ahead. You're out. Okay. You want to move that bolt up or down so you can get the, the proximity sensor flag. Since he's not here. Okay, you want to get the, the flag, the tip of the flag, approximately right where you see it. You see what, where it is in relation to the um, bracket? Right there. That's about where you want it. That's your stick, without a coin in. Okay? So you get that bolt lining up in that position. And if, if you watch, watch this. Okay, watch, focus it right on the flag here. Okay? If I. Move that bolt up or down. You see how that comes up? So you want it to get that tip of that flag <coughs> approximately in that location. Okay? <coughs> it's an approximate, so it doesn't, it's not super, super critical. Uh, if you look in the manual, it'll kind of give you a little picture showing what it should look like. Uh, page seven, down in the circle on the bottom right. That's about what it should look like at, when you're in steady state. Then what you do is you take that nut right there and you lock it in position. <coughs> That's step two. A lot of people forget step two. What, happen, what, what that does is if you've got the, the lever too far down, then it takes longer for the, 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 the flag to come down through the sensor. So if your coin's got a real long coin pulse, okay? And depending on the machine manufacturer, too long of a coin pulse will tilt it. It'll say it's um, a jam, okay? <coughs> and you don't want it any down any further than that because it could be down in, into the sensor itself and it'll give you a constant activation, in which case it'll, again, jam. It'll give you a jam tilt. Okay, so you're trying to get the, 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 the coin pulse to be consistent and within the, the machine manufacturer's parameters. Okay. Pardon? No. Second adjustment won't affect the first at all. And you want to do them in that order. You want to do the first one with the coin at maximum deflection, and then you do the second one. Okay? When you get that, all that done, put the hopper bowl back on. Again, the, the black springs at the top, gold ones at the bottom, the shoulder screw with the nut down at the 5 o'clock position. And what I would recommend is that. When you get it all put back together, immediately perform a coin out test. Okay? Not just one or two coins. I would recommend you go to about 100 coins, 50 to 100 coins, to make sure that everything's adjusted properly. And if, 
Right. You want to check the accuracy of the count, and you want to watch as the coin's being dispensed to make sure that everything looks right in the way it's activating. And preferably do it in the machine so you can um, watch the, the, the pulse parameters as it's coming out, too, because you may have to tweak the um, coin to switch adjustment. And each, machi each machine is different. So, technical term, tweak, yes. <coughs> that comes out of the machinery's handbook, if anybody's not aware of that. It's right in there next to using... Bidirectional tweaking or a unidirectional? Well, it's right next to um, fine adjustment tool definition hammer. Oh, okay. So... You can see Tavistock way by assembly, a.k.a. muscle bearing. <laughs> Okay. Now when you get the hopper bolt put back on, you probably want to tug on it a little bit and make sure you've got um, free movement in the springs. Sometimes those shoulders catch the flanges on there and while you think you've got it down all the way, it's not. So you just want to tug on it and make sure that it can rotate freely and slap it back in your machine after your coin test and you're ready to go. You might want to make a notation on the label on here what denomination you converted it to. Because if somebody looks in the machine that's supposed to be a nickel and they see a hopper that says quarter, you might end up with some trouble. Yes? The, the number five right here? Uh huh. The only one that there would be an adjustment is the dollar token. On the dollar gaming token, the, the spring will not be there. And what you'll have is you'll have two big gold collars that go between the um, plastic flange and the aluminum ring. And if you look in the, the, the conversion manual back on page 9, on step 13 where it says installing the hopper head, it kind of gives you an indication of what you need to look for for each. Okay? Make sense? Okay, now the reason we put the collars on there in a dollar is the dollar is such a big, thick coin that it needs some more room as it's coming up so it doesn't jam. Or it jams less frequently. Hoppers are always going to jam. It just happens to be the nature of the working with coins. All right, we touched on the side exit DH750 earlier. Now we're going to talk about the escalator hopper. Everybody loves escalator hoppers. Side exit hoppers are bad enough. When you start telling a coin you want it to go to a different direction and you want one coin to push another, to, to use the vernacular, they get a little irritated and they don't like being told what to do. So escalators are the, shall we say, the bane of a slot tech's world. They don't, they're problemsome. Okay, escalator hopper is virtually identical to the side exit hopper with the addition of the escalator and the transition area components which redirect the coin from a, a horizontal path of motion to a vertical path of motion. The sole purpose of an escalator is to move the exit point of the coins from the hopper from down low to somewhere up high. You'll find them in your bar top machines, you'll find them in slant tops, um, and in other various locations. I've seen some in under countertops dispensing tokens. A good example is Chuck E. Cheese. They dispense their tokens from one of our hoppers under their counters. Okay. <coughs> the escalator hopper is not as forgiving as the side exit hopper, it's a lot more precise. It's a lot more, shall we say, coin specific. So it needs to be um, configured specifically for a, a coin or a token that it's going to dispense. It will not reliably dispense something that's similar in size or close to. So if it's designed for a U.S. quarter, chances are it won't reliably dispense a U.S. quarter token or somebody else's quarter token. Okay? So it's one of the things to be aware of. They're very <coughs> unforgiving. Okay. And the escalators come in various heights. 
They come in various configurations. You can get them with the exit going this way, which is to the left, or the, to the left. Or you get it with the exits to the right. Um, you can get it with the micro switch mounted up here, or a proximity sensor. We've done one variation for the Bally bar top where the count switch is actually down at the bottom and it uses the Bally's optic. So there's some different variations of it. <coughs> Functionally, it's the same. Okay. Pull the escalator off. The conversion manual. Sorry, this is the antenna. Oh, okay. The conversion manual steps you through for a side exit. We're working on a conversion manual that will go through the steps for an escalator hopper. But virtually they're, they're the same with the, um, up through the exit area. Okay. Let me go ahead and pull the hopper bowl off here. Which one's on the top, black or gold? Thank you. Very good. All right. <coughs> Somebody was awake. As you can tell, the hopper bowl on this one I'm working on is different than the first one. We do various different configurations of hopper bowls and hoppers. Depends on capacity. Uh, depends on the manufacturer. Some game manufacturers are pressed with space constraints or space requirements in the machine. So they like hoppers that bowls that are shaped funny. So we do, we've got about 100 different variations of hopper bowls that we've done for different manufacturers and different applications over the years. Okay, if you look at the hopper, the main difference you see between this and the side exit that we looked at earlier is in this area right here. Uh, the transition area which redirects the coin from a side motion to the vertical motion. <coughs> it consists of chiefly six parts. You've got your left your right cover, right guide underneath it, a left cover, a left guide underneath it. You've got the bracket for mounting the escalator, and then we've got a coin slide plate underneath here. So you can take a side exit hopper and you can convert it to an escalator hopper very easily. It's just the replacement of a few parts. Okay, the um, Go ahead and take the, the, this cover off here so you can see what that inner guide looks like. This cover is stainless steel. It's uh, a thickened stainless steel. It's made out of, I think, 304 stainless, so it's non-magnetic. Let me just stick the screws in here to hold that guide in place. Okay. As the coin comes off the disc, off the pinwheel, off the knife, it wants to take this motion. Okay? One of the things you'll notice is the, the transition guy which is located right here, this one, it's a big long curved one. It's black. It's hardened tool steel. <coughs> Whereas this one is just regular cold roll steel. It's a soft material. Now there's a reason for that. Okay? Anybody think of why we would put a harder one down here? Where? There? Where? All your force from here is directed that way as it comes off. So all your wear is going to be on that outside guide because the coins are going to constantly be pushing outward. This one is just there to keep the, the coins from bouncing out. It doesn't get any appreciable wear at all. Same thing with this cover. This cover is hard and tool steel also. Okay. So there's not a lot of flexibility in it. Um, if it bends, chances are you really won't be able to bend it back into shape easily. And usually, if anybody's familiar with tool steel, that's been hardened and heat treated. Once it's bent, the temper's gone out of it, which means it's soft. Okay. So if that gets bent, you want to replace them. Okay. Go ahead and pull those parts off and get it right down to the bare bones here. <coughs> Screwdriver, nut driver, same tools, nothing's changed.
and I won't tear the hopper completely down. You've already seen that part. Yeah, I use the nut driver. Nice thing about dual tool fasteners. Okay, that gets down to the, the, the very essentials. Now if you look behind that transition guide, there will be a dog leg shim. You either get a gold or a silver one, depends on the, the thickness of the coin. Most of them are going to be silver. Oh, excuse me. What that does is it helps compensate for the, the thickness to allow a little more room on that side for the coin as it's coming up. <coughs> And that's easy to remember where it goes. It can only go one way, in one spot. Okay? So when you get down and do your conversion on the hopper, the steps up to this point are exactly the same. From there on, it's just replacing these guides. There's no adjustments on those guides. There is no adjustment for a count switch on the side of the hopper, because there is no count switch down on the bottom of the hopper anymore. It's up on the escalator. So in some instances, the conversion of the escalator hopper can be a little easier than the conversion of a side exit. A little more time consuming because of the number of parts involved, but it can be a little easier because you don't have all the adjustments on the count switch to worry about. Okay. Now one of the things you'll have to do is, chances are you don't want to convert the escalator. You just go buy a new escalator and put a brand new one on. Because to convert, convert the escalator, you'd probably be only keeping about four or five parts. The rest of it would have to be replaced. Don, can, can people buy directly from SI Seiko? It depends on the jurisdictions. Okay, Some jurisdictions were not licensed to sell directly to casinos, like um, good ones, New Jersey. New Jersey requires all vendors to be licensed. And we're not licensed, so we can't sell directly to them, but just about anybody else can buy directly. Oh, so it's not whether or not they're compacted, it's whether you have a license to sell in that Correct. area. Correct. Okay. If somebody, say, from Speaking Rock Casino in El Paso wanted to call you. If Speaking Rock Casino in El Paso wanted to call us and there were no Texas jurisdictional requirements that we'd be licensed, they could buy from us, yes. All they'd have to do is open an account. And that's the man to talk to. Or tribal jurisdiction. Or, right. It, it all depends on the jurisdiction and what they require for a casino's vendors. And would they talk to Vince first then and ask him, hey, can you sell to us? Yep. And if you're in a foreign country, it depends on the foreign country's jurisdictional requirements. Because I know if we go into um, Ontario, uh, all casinos in Ontario require their vendors to be licensed. And are you? We're Ontario? not licensed, no. That's the nice thing about just being a component manufacturer. You don't have to go all through all that regular um, that that red tape and uh, the registration and licensing requirements right usually in the, those jurisdictions that have the, um, those kind of requirements like um, New Jersey we do have a, um, a a distributor in New Jersey that that takes care of parts for us so we don't leave anybody out in the cold. They can still get parts, but they might not be able to come directly to us. Uh, the reason I ask is that there are some non-compacted tribes that just have so much trouble getting Williams parts or whatever, and it's really unfair. We just want to fix stuff. Yeah, so, yeah, you can come directly to us. We can find out what the requirements are. So we don't want anybody to get in trouble if they're not supposed to be going to a non-licensed company or not. So we check into it and make sure. And if it turns out that we can't, then I'm sure some things can be arranged to, to make sure the casinos get the parts they need. Yep. Okay. <coughs> All right, when you get the, the base of the hopper converted, you slide the escalator on. Things you notice about the escalator, it's 
Um, as I mentioned, there's different configurations, um, exit sides, count switch, heights, things like that. They're all screwed together. Okay? Some hopper manufacturers like to weld them together. What we found is if you weld it together, it makes it a little harder or a little more difficult to clear some of the jams. With the, the screws in there, you can loosen the screws up and a lot of times the jam coins just fall out. And then you tighten the screws back up and the escalator is ready to go with no bent parts or pieces or damage. Um, one of the things we've come across is slot floormen, not the slot tacks, the slot floormen get those real big long three foot screwdrivers. The that they, they walk around like this all the time because the, the screwdrivers <laughs> so long. They get in there and they'll start prying and bending everything or or they'll get their screwdriver in there and start hammering on it to, to get a coin out. Well, what that does is, yeah, you can free the coin jam, but you severely damage the parts on the escalator and now your coin jams are going to be more frequent. It's mostly the creation of burrs, is it not? The creation of burrs, gouges, um, bent parts, Anytime you can, the, the coin gets freedom to do something other than what you want it to do, it's going to do it. One. It's the replace, the tightening of two wing bolts. We have on the escalator a uh, check ball. What it does is it helps keep the coin from flowing backwards and takes pressure off on the motor. Because once the coins come up here, you don't have the motor pushing that many coins. And it's actually just a ball in a slanted race, so it's <coughs> it creates a wedging action. And I'll sh show you how that works. Stick the coin in. <coughs> it won't go backwards. Another nice benefit to that is if you pull an escalator off, you don't have all your coins fall out of the escalator. You just have the, the few that are down in this area. <coughs> oh, man. Hence, look what you started. Heimlich, Heimlich maneuver? Oh. Okay. No, it's not that bad. Okay. Thanks. You got a knife? I know a joke about the Heimlich maneuver, but I'm not going to say it. Okay. What's that? Okay. There's also, in many of our escalators, you'll see a, um, if you focus in on here, there's like a little indentation. Yeah, I like that. In the back. See that? I'll do it sideways, and you can see that it. Actually, if you turn it probably toward turn it completely, you can turn really the back see it. Okay, right here. So it kind of protrudes from the back of the escalator a little bit. What that does, and this was something that we came up with to eliminate more shims that the Japanese like to put in. <coughs> because the coin, as it's traveling up the escalator, makes the bend, what happens is the coin actually or the amount of space the coin needs gets thicker, gets greater, because the coin is, um, instead of being a flat, now you're resting on two points, the leading and trailing edge, so it spaces it out. Well, the Japanese used to put shim washers in the bend of the escalator to compensate for that. Well, if you're working on an escalator or that, and all the shim washers fall out, well. So what they did, and they said, well, we'll put a little relief dimple in the back of it to eliminate the shims. So what happens is the coin, leading and trailing edge of the coin, actually drop down a little bit. So the coin, instead of just riding on the leading, leading and trailing point as they're moving up, now ride on four points. You get a more stable motion of the coin going up there, and it eliminates all the shim washers. <coughs> okay, there's only one adjustment. You like that? I like that. I got it on tape. There's only one adjust adjustment you'll possibly have to make. 
when you do this. The escalators, they will not come adjusted for the coin. Okay? Um, they're considered a, a piece or a part on our end. And the only time we do final adjustments for any coins is if we build a complete hopper. So the escalators won't come adjusted from the factory for the coin. <coughs> so you need to stick the coin in there, get it at top dead center. There we go. Center, <laughs> Top dead center. Yeah. TDC. Okay. So you want to get maximum deflection, and you want to look at where the, um, the the flag is in relation to the sensor. And what you might need to do is there's a couple little screws. There's one down underneath here. Loosen that up. Loosen that one up at the top there, and you can get some motion out of the sensor. Okay, so you put that maximum deflection, and it's again the same type. You want the flag to be even or just slightly protruding below. Okay. Below the bottom part. Of yeah, just slightly below the bottom of the flag, just slightly below the the bottom or flush. Then you just tighten the sensor in position. Using those two screws. And you're done. And away it goes. See, it's a little easier than the side exit hopper. You got a few more parts to work with, but the adjustments when you get done are easier. <coughs> There's also a on, on a lot of them, not everyone, depends on the hopper. <coughs> a metal bracket at the top here. That is flexible. If you loosen the screw, what you'll see is that piece can move up and down. Okay. What that is for, and I'll show you. I'll remove it and show you what'll happen without it. It doesn't happen on everyone. It depend, it's, depends on the escalator. But without it, one of the things that could happen is this. You know what that'll do? What's that going to do? It's going to it's going to double count for a single coin. You get one count going through and then one count going back. So you actually end up with short pays. Cuz it says it dispensed two when it only dispensed one. So, what that does is it acts as a stop to keep the flag from over-traveling. And again, not every escalator requires it. For some escalators, it is impossible that a coin would be able to, to do that. Okay. And I lost my screw. <laughs> Screws fall on this the floor. This is the dignified part of the job, ain't it? Yeah, that's okay. Finding a contact. That's okay. Don't need it. It's a spare part. Oh, ha <laughs> ha! Voila! It didn't go on the floor. It didn't go on the floor. Just use a screwdriver. Just keep, use something that's close in size, right? I thought I always keep a pocket full of wood screws around because they fit anything. <laughs> <laughs> and what you want to do on, if you have to adjust that, again, put the coin at maximum deflection. And you want that to be just above. Okay? So you want to give a little extra motion on it, but you don't want to give enough that it can go through and double count. And you, and you don't want to give it too little because otherwise the coin will get stuck. Or it'll get premature wear because the hopper is trying to force the coin to come out the exit. But there's your adjustments. There's what you need to do. And again, run a payout test on it to make sure that everything 
works the way it's supposed to. Now, one of the things we've done to assist you in your job and keeping your customers happy is we've designed a replacement escalator for William Slant Top. If you remember the old William Slant Top escalator, it was open on the back and it was all spot welded together. We've got a replacement, and there's an, uh, an advertisement in the back of Slot Text that gives you a, a picture of it. Inside back cover of, of the newer, not May issue, but like look in November, December, I think it's going back to yeah. And it's available as a direct replacement. It just drops right on. No changes. It's and transparent. It comes with a bracket you're going to need because you're going from spot welding to screws. And it effectively looks like this kind of escalator with the screws holding it all together. With the um, coin, the, the back of the escalator will be solid. The coins travel on the front surface of it. And our field trials that we've conducted have shown market improvement with um, the reduction in coin jams or service calls for escalator related, related problems hey, on the hoppers. America. Would you like to know the part number? Yeah. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I do. Oh, God. You better tell them which denomination you're giving them the part number for. Uh, I'll give them one for nickel inquiry. <coughs> there you go. Okay. That's it. Any questions? Anybody have concerns about escalator hoppers? Anybody got any good jokes? I need new material. I have a question for you, and that is mm -hmm. regarding the, the amount of leverage on this and moving huh. this back and forth. Okay, that's a good thing. I forgot about that. I forgot about that. Good idea. Good, good comment. Okay. One of the things on the escalators, you want to make sure that you don't have any stress on the escalator, whereas you're pulling it back or pushing it forward or that, because <laughs> one of the convenient things about this is there are some people out there in the casino world that thinks this makes a convenient carrying handle, especially if the hopper's on the floor. Ah, we'll just pick it up and, and we'll full, walk around. Full of coins. And if it's full of coins... Oops. Okay. And if it's full of coins, it makes the problem worse. Focus is, let me pull the hopper ball back off. It'll make it easier to see. And it's something, this is something that's important to watch out for. I know none of you pick up hoppers by the escalators. You know better. More anyway. You know better. Not after January 9th. You don't do that, do you? The what? The ring? Nice aluminum ring. Right here. That'll work. Okay. All right. Focus in on this area right here, Randy. Right there. Now watch what happens if I um, pull back on this. Okay. I'll give it a couple quarters in there. See what happens if I pull back on that a little bit? Yeah. Yep. So that's one of the big things that happens. So you want to make sure that escalator doesn't have any tension placed on it. Um, you want to make sure that the, that back bracket isn't bent. How about the tension in the other direction? Tension in the other direction? Well, if you put it in the other direction, you won't get a coin that goes through because that tip moves downward. Okay? So, tension in either direction, big problem. Bad mojo. Was Don't there not a little indent on the top of the knife? We talked about knife places before and, and, and using the feeler gauge, but 
I thought there was a little place where that went, or was I thinking of this guy? It's right, right back here. in That's here. This guy got right there. On the transition guy, when you place it in there, yeah, let me get, get on. you know, there's a little. You know, it's easier to see if I remove this, but there's a little notch that the tip of that fits right down into. Yeah. Right in here, there's a little notch right there. So the tip of this transition guy just sits right down in that notch, and you want to make sure that the coin, as it travels across there, is nice and flush. Usually it just drops right in and it turns out nice and flush when you're doing it anyway. That's a good thing to watch out for. Okay. Thank you, Randy. I knew I brought you along for something. Anybody else have any questions? Yes. The jump assembly right here, yes. Mm -hmm. 1.8 millimeters. We also have the thickness of the coin. Right, which it's actually the coin thickness, not particularly the denomination, but the thickness. Uh, 1.8. A U.S. quarter measures 1.7, so we would, the 1.8 would apply to that because that the adjusting plate is available or works for a particular thickness range. I think it's the the thickness marked on the back um, minus 0.3 millimeters plus zero, so that'll work for a 1.5 to a 1.8 thick coin. Then we also have a 2 millimeter, a 2.3, and a 2.9. So. There's a, yeah, okay, but it, it's based on the thickness. See, many of the parts are work for different ranges of coins, like a, a U.S. quartered pinwheel works from a, a, a small diameter coin and goes up to a larger one, uh, plus or minus one, one and a half millimeters. I don't know, remember off the top of my head. So it will function um, across some small ranges. Okay. Anything else? How about if the brake goes off? Does that have a brake? AC motors, um, he asked if the, what if the brake goes out on the motor? AC <laughs> motors are equipped with a mechanical brake on them. There's a DC motor you have. Right. This oh. is a DC motor. Oh, oh all right, right, right. DC motors are not equipped with a brake, a mechanical brake. Uh, most of the time on DC motors, they incorporate a braking circuit within the, the hopper controller. This is the mechanical <laughs> brake. Right. Yep. Um, and of course, that keeps the pinwheel from coasting and overpaying on. Mm -hmm. The DC motors, what they'll do is they'll do a, a momentarily reverse of polarity. So they spin the motor backwards for a split second. On the AC motors, it's got a mechanical brake. When the motor's activated, this lever is attracted to the motor coil, allows the motor to, to spin and activate the pinwheel. When you remove voltage, the magnetism is removed and that immediately pops up because it's spring-loaded and shuts the motor down instantly. Now, occasionally those components could fail. They could get bent, you know, somebody gets in there with a screwdriver or a pair of pliers and thinks they know what they're doing. and tweaks them away or a spring falls <laughs> off or something. We do have the motor brake parts available for replacement. Okay. So in order to the, the brake, the little nylon stopper and the spring underneath there, we've got those available for replacement. <laughs> Question in the back. Um, any, he said, is there anything you can do with the DC motors so that when they don't stop the, um, to keep the, in other words, they're coasting a little bit. <coughs> how, how they stop it is dependent on the machine manufacturer. We have a brake board that we um, can incorporate in the hopper if it's requested. And what that does is exactly like I said, it's a momentarily reverse of polarity on the, the motor to, to spin it backwards and stop it for a little bit. The uh, hopper housing for the uh, bearing ring, mm -hmm. so it starts to make that groove in there. How deep of a groove can it give if that's a problem? Um, Did you guys hear the question in the back? When, 
even when the bearing makes, makes yeah. that little groove in the backing plate, how deep can it be before it starts messing stuff up? I'd say almost anything. Huh? Well, no, it, it's got a limit on there. Uh, I don't remember what it is off the top of my head, to be honest with you. It won't make, it can't make it one that's too deep because the bearings are only protrude from the race a little bit. But I would say that if you if you've got a a gap between your because the knife is mounted onto the aluminum hood and the di pinwheel sits right on that 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 plate underneath where the bearings are the the knife won't move inward when that groove develops so you will definitely see a gap behind it and if you get a gap that you can't get to a, the optimum position, then I would say, you know, that's bad. Uh, we've, done 10 million, we've done 10 million coins on a hopper without having a problem with that wear. So you should be able to get at least 10 million plus out. And if you get a 10 million plus out, um, that's what we consider the, the, the normal lifespan of the hopper. You, you probably should go in and do a complete um, diagnostic on the hopper, tear it all down, check the components, and do a rebuild on it. Is it fair to say if you're going through knives and maybe you haven't noticed that there's so much of a gap there, but man, I replaced three knives in three weeks in this thing, going that's a logical knives, place. Uh, Constant double coins behind the knives, things like that. But at, at about 10 million coins out, you probably want to take that hopper down and do a complete invest, um, evaluation on it. And in some locations, 10 million coins is five days. Hmm? Elgin River boat, 200,000 plus a day dispensed. That's not coin in, that's coin out per machine. So. Okay. Well, thank you very. Are you done? Or is that I'm done. That's it. Thank you very much. Right.